Hello friends and welcome to tonight's edition of Sleep Stories. In tonight's journey, I will tell you tales from a collection of stories by Abby Phillips Walker called Sandman's Goodnight Stories. If you enjoy these stories, I would encourage you to subscribe so you will be notified of upcoming sleep stories. If you would like to support this channel, you can become a channel member. This will give you access to early releases as well as channel member only content. You can explore the options by clicking the join or membership button. I thank you all for your support. It is time to unwind. A few thoughts to help you relax. Find a comfortable place. Make yourself feel at ease. And take a deep breath. You can hear the sound of the gentle ocean. The waves never ending, lapping up on the shore, and then ebbing away again. With each wave, you become more relaxed. Your day is done. There is nothing left to do but to listen to these stories and get ready to fall asleep. And now, let's begin these stories. Discontented Dewdrop One morning, a little dewdrop was resting on the petal of a wild rose that grew beside the river. The sun shining on it made it glisten like a diamond, and a lady who was passing stopped to admire its beauty. It is the most beautiful thing in the world, she remarked. See the colors in that tiny little drop. Isn't it wonderful? Wonderful, repeated the dewdrop, when the lady had walked away. If I were like the river, I might be wonderful. It is too bad. Here I am sitting here while the river can run on and on and see all the sights. It bubbles and babbles as it goes, and that is worthwhile. I have never a chance to be wonderful. Oh, if I were only in the river water, I might be something. Just then, a breeze passing heard the little dewdrop's wish. You shall have your wish, foolish dewdrop, she said, blowing gently on the rose, which swayed, and off went the little dewdrop into the rushing river. This is like something being a part of this river, said the dewdrop as it mingled its tiny drop with the running river. Now I am worth admiring and can see something of the world. On and on it ran with the water of the river, but it was no longer a dewdrop. It was part of the river. I wish I could stop for a minute so someone might admire me said the silly little drop, for it thought it could still be seen, and was making all the babbling it heard as the river ran along. But no one admired it, nor did it stop. On went the river to a larger river, and by and by it came to the bay, and the dewdrop went rolling into it with the other water. Surely I am greater now than ever, and worth admiring, 
sought the drop. But it heard no sweet words, such as the lady spoke of the little dewdrop on the rose by the river. The bay mingled at last with the ocean. And little dewdrop knew at last that it was no longer a thing to be admired for itself alone, but a part of a great ocean. It was completely lost in the vastness of the mighty waters, of which it was only a drop. The breeze went whispering over it, calling, Little dewdrop, little dewdrop, where are you? But the drop answered never a word. It did not even hear the gentle voice of the breeze, so loud was the roar of the ocean. Come away, called a loud wind to the gentle breeze. That is no place for you. I would blow here and make the waves high, and you will never find your little dewdrop. It has been swallowed long ago by the ocean. Go back to your river and tell the other dewdrops the fate of their companion. The gentle breeze went away, and the loud wind swept the ocean, making the waves high and the roar louder and louder. The little dewdrop was there somewhere in the great hole, but it was lost forever, in its longing to become great. The gentle breeze went back to the river, and as she sighed around the rose where the discontented dewdrop had rested, she heard another drop say, Look at the river, isn't it big? Here am I, only a dewdrop, so small no one can see me. Ah, that is where you are mistaken, my dainty dewdrop, said the gentle breeze. You can be seen now. But if you were to become a part of the river, you would never be seen. You would lose your identity as soon as you mingled with the waters of the river. Be your own sweet self, and be content with the part you play in this world. You are helping to make it more beautiful by your own dainty beauty. Do not wish to do what only seems a greater thing. And then she told the fate of the discontented dewdrop that had wished to become great, and how at last it was swallowed by its own greatness and its dainty beauty, which had been so admired, no longer remained. Be content with the small but beautiful part you play in this world, she told the drop, and do not long for a greatness, which may result in your unhappiness. Jack the Preacher one morning in the very early springtime, the big evergreen trees began to talk about the part they took in telling all the woodland flowers that it was spring. Why, if we were not here, said one evergreen tree, who would wake these sleepy springtime flowers to their duty? I should like you to tell me. You speak truly, brother, said another tree. We are evergreen, and need no awaking to our duty. But for us, the woods would be a sorry-looking place in the summer. Those lazy crocuses would sleep right on and on. Yes, the little violets never would dare show their timid little heads, said another evergreen tree. When the soft winds begin to run through the woods, it is then we call forth to all sleeping flowers and shrubs and bushes. Awake, it is time to get up. And who would tell the bee summer was on its way, said another tree. He would never get his work started at all if it were not for us. How lucky the flowers and all the woodland things are 
that we are here to tell them when to get up. So the evergreens talked and bragged about how they preached springtime to the woodland folk. And as they talked, all the spring flowers awoke, and the insects began lazily to stretch their wings. But it was not because of what the big evergreen trees were saying. No, it was because they had heard the voice of the little woodland preacher. And who was he, do you think? Why, no other than Jack in the pulpit, who gives a talk every spring to all the woodland dwellers on just how to bloom and how to buzz and when to do it. Every night, for ever so long before it is time for the crocus or the violet or any early spring flower to bloom, when it is the magic hour, the fairies come running through the woods and touch Jack on his nodding little head, under the dry leaves, and up he pops and begins to preach. So when the flowers and bees and things heard the big evergreen trees talking, they nodded to each other and laughed. Isn't it funny to hear them, said a beautiful yellow crocus. Those tall trees know nothing about the real truth of things. Do they? Fancy thinking they awaken us, said another flower. Why, they themselves are asleep. They get so used to the winter they stand still all the time. But who is to tell them the truth about our preacher Jack? The evergreen trees never bend to sway to one side or the other far enough to see the beauties of our woodland spring. They only know what the winds tell them. Let them think what they like, said the little bush of pretty blossoms. It does not hurt Jack in the pulpit if the evergreens think they are the preachers of the woods. For all the spring and summer, flowers know that Jack has always been our preacher and the evergreens haven't any pulpit to preach from. Only they do not know it. And so the sleepy old evergreens thought they were the ones who awakened the flowers and preached to them about their duty. And no one ever told them about little Jack in the pulpit, who always has and always will preach about the spring and summer to all the woodland dwellers. Mr. Crow Mr. Coon and Mr. Possum lived near each other in the woods, and one day they decided to give a supper the first bright moonlight night. It will be much easier for us to provide the supper together, said Mr. Coon, because we are bachelors and we can help each other. But the real reason was that Mr. Coon knew that Mr. Possum had some new tin spoons and all the Coon family love shiny things. He thought he might be able to slip one or two tin spoons into his pocket and never be found out, because there would be so many guests that Mr. Possum would not know which one to suspect when he found it out. Mr. Possum was delighted to do, as Mr. Coon suggested, and they began making out a list of guests to be invited. Of course, there was Mr. Fox, and Mr. Squirrel, and Jack Rabbit, and Mr. Owl, who were all bachelors like themselves. So they decided they would not ask any of the married folks, but call it a bachelor party. Old James Crow lives in the tree near me. We'll think he should be invited too, I suppose, said Mr. Possum, but he is such a quarrelsome old fellow, I hate to ask him. No, don't ask him, said Mr. Coon, 
thinking of Mr. Possum's new tin spoons, and remembering that the Crow family were very like his own in the matter of liking bright and glittering things. He will never know we have a party. He goes to bed at sunset, you know. So it was decided that old James Crow was not to be invited, and that only the bachelors of the wood were to be asked. A few nights after this, the moon shone brightly, and over to Mr. Possum's house they all went. Now it happened that they began to sing when they all sat down to the table, that they all were jolly good fellows, and something about being single was a life of bliss, and another about poor married men, and they made so much noise that they awoke old James Crow who was sound asleep in his bed. What is that noise? he said, jumping up and listening. But when he heard it again, old Mr. Crow got out of bed and put his head out of the window. Oh, we are jolly bachelor boys, came from Mr. Possum's house and floated right up to Mr. Crow's window. Something is going on that I do not know about, said old Mr. Crow. Pulling in his head and taking off his nightcap. I must find out what it is. I should say that the noise came from Mr. Possum's house. I'll go right down there and see. And he did, arriving just as the supper was being put on the table. And while Mr. Crow did not go to the door, he had no trouble at all in looking in through the shutters, for old Mr. Crow was very clever in the art of spying. There was a big fat turkey, but Mr. Crow did not care about that. That is, he was not crazy about turkey. He could eat it if there was nothing better. But when the big dish of green corn was brought in, Mr. Crow began to think he had been slighted, and that he should have been asked to the party. Jack Rabbit stood up in his chair, so he would be tall enough to be seen, and held up a crisp radish. Here is to our hosts, Mr. Coon and Mr. Possum, he said, taking a bite of the radish. So, thought old Mr. Crow, Mr. Possum is giving this supper, and he is a neighbor. Then somebody began to sing, We are the bachelors of the wood. We wouldn't be married if we could. And then Mr. Crow was good and mad. Giving a bachelor party, are they? He thought. And they left me out. I am a bachelor just as much as any of those fellows. I'll pay them back for slighting me if it takes me a hundred years. Just then, the ice cream was brought in, and Mr. Crow espied the new tin spoons, and his eyes shone with longing to have one or two or three, or as many as he could get. But how could he get them? If only he could scare them and make them all run, he would get them easy enough. Then an idea came to Mr. Crow, and he flew away. I'll have those spoons before I sleep again tonight. And get my revenge too, or my name is not James Crow, he said, and out of the woods he went. Mr. Crow flew straight for Mr. Man's farm, and you know crows can fly very straight, it is said. When he arrived it was all still. Not a sound could be heard, but Mr. Dog breathing very hard. But it was Mr. Dog that Mr. Crow wanted, so it was easy to find him by following the noise. Mr. Crow tapped on the side of Mr. Dog's house, for his door was open and outbounded Mr. Dog with a growl. 
Hush, don't make a noise, said Mr. Crow. Are you free to run over to the woods? Yes, I see you are, he said, looking at Mr. Dog's collar and seeing there was no chain fastened to it. Do you want some fun? asked Mr. Dog. Mr. Dog began to jump about and wag his tail. He was always ready for fun, he told Mr. Crow. But where is it at this time of night? he asked. You come with me, said Mr. Crow, and if I do not show you more sport in a minute than you ever had in an hour hunting with Mr. Man, I'll eat all the spoons. What spoons? asked Mr. Dog, standing still and dropping his tail. I don't want to run off the spoons. Oh, I did not mean spoons at all, said Mr. Crow. I should have said I would eat my hat, but I promise you there will be fun and plenty of it. Mr. Coon and Mr. Possum are giving a supper in the woods, and the guests are Mr. Squirrel. Tell me no more. I do not care about the guests. Hurry, hurry. Where are they? said Mr. Dog dancing about so fast that Mr. Crow could not turn quick enough to keep up with him. Come along and I will show you, he said. And off they flew, keeping close to the ground so that Mr. Dog could follow him. The supper was still going on when they arrived. Mr. Crow flew to a tree close by, for he knew that Mr. Dog could manage alone now that he had shown him the place. Mr. Dog did not stop to knock. He bounded in through the window, taking off a shutter as he went. Out of the back door, out of the front door, and out of the windows went the guests and their hosts. And after them, barking, went Mr. Dog. They are jolly fellows all right now, croaked Mr. Crow, as he watched them out of sight. And now my party begins. Mr. Crow went in and took all the spoons from the deserted supper table and carried them off to his house. He hid them under the bed, and then he got in and went to sleep. He did not even bother to go over to see Mr. Dog the next day. So little did he care how the chase came out. He knew Mr. Dog did not catch Mr. Possum or Mr. Coon, because he saw them both the next day. But that was all he knew, and all he cared, for those were the two he had in his plan for revenge. The next day, when Mr. Coon was out, and Mr. Crow made sure he was not only away from home, but out of the woods. Mr. Crow took all the spoons but one under his wing and went over to Mr. Coon's house, and got in the cellar window. He went upstairs and put those spoons between Mr. Coon's feather beds. Mr. Coon had two feather beds always having plenty of feathers on hand as he did. Then Mr. Crow went over to Mr. Possum's house and found him sitting in the doorway, looking very sad. What is the matter with you, friend Possum? asked Mr. Crow in the most friendly tone he could master. Don't you feel well? I have lost all my new tin spoons, said Mr. Possum. Someone stole them, I'm afraid. He did not want Mr. Crow to know about the party, so he did not tell him any more. That is too bad, said Mr. Crow. Were they anything like those Mr. Coon has? I saw him cleaning some very handsome ones this morning as I passed his window. I did not know he had any spoons said Mr. Possum. He has never told me he had any tin spoons. Are you sure you saw them? 
Just as sure as I am that I see you now, Mr. Possum, said Mr. Crow. But of course, they would not have anything to do with your spoons. I was wondering if his were like yours. If they are, I could take a look at them, and then, if in my travels I saw any like them, I would know they were yours and bring them back to you. I am very clever at finding things that are lost. Mr. Possum did not seem inclined to say anything. And Mr. Crow went on. Why don't you come along with me to Mr. Coon's house and get him to show us his spoons? I am anxious to help you if I can. I know how I should feel if I lost some handsome tin spoons. This seemed to make Mr. Possum interested, so he walked along with Mr. Crow, who was so anxious to get to Mr. Coon's he could hardly keep from flying. Mr. Coon had just returned when they arrived and was unlocking his door. I lost all my new tin spoons last night, said Mr. Possum. Mr. Crow said he saw you cleaning some, and if they were like mine, he would like to take a look at them, and then he might find mine. But I did not know you had any spoons. Mr. Crow held his head very high and looked sideways while Mr. Possum was talking. But out of the corner of one eye, he could see Mr. Coon, and he saw him turn around and look at him very angrily. Mr. Crow said I had some tin spoons, he said. He has sharper eyes than I thought, and I always knew he had sharp eyes, particularly for bright things. But how he could see spoons in my house is more than I can explain, for I have no spoons. Well, of course, I do not wish to cause any trouble, said Mr. Crow. But I certainly saw you cleaning tin spoons. Anyway, it will be easy to prove you have no spoons in the house by letting us search. And of course, you rather would, Mr. Coon, for that will clear you from suspicion, that is, if we do not find them. Go ahead and look said Mr. Coon, opening the door and standing aside for them to enter. And I am glad I did not take one of those spoons, he thought to himself, for he remembered that he had intended to do so if Mr. Dog had not come in so unexpectedly. Of course, Mr. Crow held back and let Mr. Possum do all the hunting, until they came to Mr. Coon's bedroom, and then he said, I have always heard that stolen goods are often hidden between beds. We might look there first. Of course, they found the spoons, and when Mr. Coon saw them, he almost fell over. Who put them there? I did not, he said. Of course you didn't, said Mr. Crow, with a smile that plainly said, You are a storyteller. There is one spoon missing, said Mr. Possum, who had been counting the spoons. I had a dozen, and there are only eleven here. He probably ate his breakfast with that one, said Mr. Crow. Better give it up, Mr. Coon. We have caught you, and there is no use denying it now. Go ahead and find it if you can, said Mr. Coon. I did not take those spoons, and I do not know where the other spoon is, even if you do, Mr. Crow. What do you mean by that? asked Mr. Crow, beginning to hop about. I mean that you seem to be pretty sure where those spoons were, said Mr. Coon, and if I am not mistaken about the history of your family... They are noted for their love of shining things fully as much as ours. Come along, said Mr. Crow to Mr. Possum. We have found our spoons, and that is all I wanted. I cannot bother with this bad fellow, who now wants to make out. I took the spoons. But that 
is always the way with thieves. They blame it on someone else if they can. The more Mr. Coon thought about those spoons, the more certain he was that Mr. Crow had something to do with their being found in his house. So one night, about a week after, he went to Mr. Crow's house and watched. By and by, he saw the light go out, and he thought, after all, he was not to catch Mr. Crow that night. But just as he was going away, he saw a tiny flicker of light at another window. Up went Mr. Coon and peeked in. And what do you think he saw? Mr. Crow sitting at the table, eating bread and milk with Mr. Possum's missing tin spoon. It did not take Mr. Coon long to run to Mr. Possum's house and bring him back with him and show him his spoon. And then, right through the window, they jumped and grabbed Mr. Crow by the nape of his neck. And how they did shake the old thief. They did not stop to talk to him. He is not worth the breath we should waste, said Mr. Coon, and I feel sure this place is not a place that agrees with Mr. Crow's health. He will move away, I am sure, but the climate will better agree with him. The next day, there was a to let sign on the house where Mr. Crow had once lived. And the bachelors all met that night to discuss the breaking up of the party and to hear about the tin spoons and how they were found. And it is in my opinion, said Mr. Coon, that if someone were to ask Mr. Doc, he would tell us that Mr. Crow went and told him about our party. But who will ask Mr. Doc? asked Jack Rabbit. No one seemed to be interested enough to ask Mr. Doc, and they never knew for sure whether he told or not. But Mr. Coon always said he did. At any rate, the wood folk were rid of old Mr. Crow, and they were glad of it. The Frogs and the Fairies In a pond dell lived a big family of frogs, and one day, when the sun was shining, all the young bullfrogs came up out of the water and hopped on the bank. I think it would be fun to see what it is in the dell beside this pond, said Billy Bull, who was a young and inquisitive frog. What do you fellows say to a lark tonight by the light of the moon? We'll go, we'll go, Billy Bull, said all the other young frogs in chorus. Better stay home, better stay home, croaked old Grandfather Bullfrog from his seat on a stump by the edge of the pond. Oh, hear old grandfather croaking, said Billy Bull. He never went out of this pond in all his days. And what does he know of the dell? Better stay home, better stay home, croaked grandfather Frog. You can, grandfather Frog, if you like, but we young frogs are going for a lark tonight. And when we come back, we will tell you what is in the dell, said Billy Bull. That night, when the moon was up and shining through the trees, out of the pond leaped all the young froggies. Better stay home, better stay home, croaked Grandfather Frog from his seat on the stump. But the young froggies only laughed as Grandfather's warning followed them through the dell. Better stay home, better stay home. It happened that the fairies were holding a party that night, and when Billy Bull and all the other young frogs hopped and leaped into the middle of the dell, they saw the bright lights of the firefly's lanterns. 
Looks to me like all the fireflies in the world had gathered for us to feast on, said Billy Bull. What luck for us. Away off they could still hear Grandfather Frog, croaking his warning. Better stay home, better stay home. But it was no warning to the young froggies. They only saw the fireflies and the feast in store for them. The froggies had never seen the fairies before, and they thought they too were little insects. So, without stopping to think or look closer into the midst of the fairy revel, in leaped Billy Bull and all his cousins. But the fairies were as quick as the frogs, and no sooner had they leapt, than up went all the fairy wands, and there stood each frog still and stiff. They were not able to move, they could only stare and listen. What are these creatures that dare to disturb us? asked the queen. Your majesty, they are frogs, said the firefly and I expect they intend to eat us. Eat the lantern bearers of the fairies, said the queen. They shall suffer for this. Off with the toe on each front foot, and then perhaps these frogs will stay at home and not hop about at night. Where do they live? asked the queen. In the pond at the end of the dell, said the fireflies. Send them home, said the queen, and every time they wander far from their pond they shall lose a toe. Down on the foot of the froggies went the fairy wands. And where the frogs had five toes, there remained only four on each of the front feet. And then, with their wands on the heads of the froggies, the fairies turned them around and drove them back to the pond. Better stay at home, better stay at home, croaked their grandfather frog, as the young froggies leapt sadly into the pond and buried themselves in the mud at the bottom. And that was the way it is said frogs came to have five toes on each of their hind feet, and only four toes on each front foot. If they had listened to their grandfather's warning, they would still have their other toes. <laughs>